Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB Foundation Level Certification. We are in Chapter 5 talking about managing test activities and continuing ahead with our next segment which is 5.5 Defect Management. And here we'll be talking about what is the reason we should write a defect report and what can we include in a defect report. When it comes to defect management, someone should really understand what exactly is the process of managing defects within the life cycle and what are those activities and artifacts involved in managing defects altogether when it comes to a TLC, which is software testing life cycle. In fact, at some point of time, anyone should be able to answer three different questions related to this. That is, what is a defect? Why should we write a defect report? And what should we include in a defect report? In this particular section, we'll be talking about answering the two questions because the first question has been already answered in the chapter one, that is, what is defect? A defect is certainly a deviation experienced as a part of the validation process, which is testing, and it is even referred to as the deviation from the expectation or deviation from the requirements. Or even sometimes we do use the words like anomalies, which are identified between the expected and the actual result. So this has been discussed as a part of chapter one. In this particular tutorial, we'll be talking about why should I write a defect report and what should we include in a defect reports. So let's quickly look into it and understand more about the reason, the objective involved in writing a defect report. So when it comes to the objectives, the typical defect reports objectives include provide those responsible for handling and resolving reported defects with sufficient information to resolve the issue. It's a very straightforward thing when the testing is being conducted and a test case fails. It's only a tester in very much isolation who knows what went wrong, what was the problem, what was the defect all about. But until unless this person writes a report, nobody else can really understand what went wrong. And verbal communications are not recommended at this point of time. That means a tester cannot go to everybody's desk because it's just not the developer who is going to resolve the issue, but there are many other stakeholders who might be interested in the defect information. To take a call, to make a decision, or sometime to defer it, or probably take resolution actions. And not just summary is enough, there are many other things which we do include in the defect report. Thus, documenting it is very important for other stakeholders to understand that what is the defect all about. So that's the very first objective. Whereas the second objective says, provide a means of tracking the quality of the work product. When we talk about the quality of the work product, here we certainly understand that the work products what we are using or what we are testing, both the things can be evaluated right from the defect report. For example, if, the, if we talk about our own what defects like test cases, then what test cases are resulting into good identification of defects and what test cases are not really helping us to find some good defects. I can make judgment on the selection of regression test suite or those test cases to be put into regression test suite. Also, I can select good candidates, learn lessons from the test cases, which can be very helpful on a long run for me to even write similar type of test cases for upcoming projects as well. On the other hand, the test uh, artifacts which we are testing, like code design, if I'm finding a lot of defects related to code, then I know my unit testing was poor. Or if I find a lot of defects related to code, I can even say the development has to improve, right? So it helps me understand the quality of the work product on either side of it. Whereas the third objective involved in defect management or for writing defect report includes provide ideas for improvement of the development and test process. So certainly by having defect report being created or written, I can capture those information which will also tell me which face identified the issue or the defect and which work product had most number of defects related to it, which could further help me to understand that which area of the life cycle needs a little bit of more improvement. In a simple example, assume that I got 100 defects in a project out of which 70 were related to misunderstanding of requirements. However, we say that we conducted static testing at the time when the requirements were being written. That means we reviewed the requirement and we found some good defects there as well. But point being made is if in dynamic testing out of 170 defects were related to misunderstanding of requirement, then I think my static testing needs to be improved. So it's just not the other activities of the development lifecycle, but within testing also the previous or early testings could also be improved by just having defect management done properly. 
Thus, these three objectives contribute to the overall defect management by being conducted in a very, very professional way. So given that we know the objectives, it's time for us to understand what exactly should we include in a defect report in nutshell. So when it comes to writing a defect report, it's not really a standard list of items what I can include or standard list of fields, legends, what should I include in the defect report. However, there are certain standards like ISO, IEEE 829, which do declare that these are some of the minimum fields what you should always include. But however, you can include anything beyond that as per your product and project characteristics or even related to your domain specific. So it's not necessary that these are the only fields what you're going to see in a moment are the only fields to be included in defect report. You can certainly have more and more details further beyond this in order to make sure that you have a wonderful defect management as per your expectation. Thus, ISTQB does not claim that this is the very, very standard list of defect report fields, what you should have, and there's nothing else required. So let's quickly have a look on what are those fields we are talking about. So defect report logged during dynamic testing typically include. Now, when we say typically, of course, we are trying to talk about those simple things, what which should be there bare minimum. So the items include unique identifier, which is identification ID of a defect, title with a short summary of the anomaly being reported, a short one-liner, which will tell the people that what is the defect all about, then date when the anomaly was observed, issuing organization and author, including their role. So date is of course, to track the progress. Issuing organization means who identified it and the author, the person who did that and of course, their role, because it's not necessary that only testers can find a defect when it comes to review, even developers, designers can also find defects. So in that context, it becomes pretty important to include the name of the person as well and their role. Also identification of the test object and environment. The test object means here the item being tested and the environment certainly means where did you identify. As we do understand, there are a lot of stage, a lot of different environments. So we do make sure that which environment did we identify it in. Also to add context of the defect, which basically talks about the test case being run, the activity being performed, which phase other relevant information such as technique, which helped you find it. So include any, any of those information which helps someone understand more about how this defect can be understood or how this defect can be identified further or even reproduced when required. Further to add description. So summary is just a one line title but description of the failure would further give all the details of the description of a defect, which helps detailed understanding of the issue. And that can include any relevant test logs, uh, database dumps, screenshots, or any kind of video recording as well. Also expected results and actual results should be captured along with the defect report. Severity, which certainly means the impact of the defect on the system or the end user. Priority to fix, which in simple word means the urgency to resolve the issue, like what should be fixed first compared to other defects and status of defect at any point of time. However, on this point, I would like to share that there is a complete defect tracking lifecycle, which uh, do make a lot of sense to any organization. The journey of a defect is called as bug lifecycle or defect lifecycle, but the status are completely left to organization that what kind of status we do you like to make use of. You have the complete freedom on that. However, there are some common and standard uh, naming conventions for some of the status like new, open, resolved, reopen, and closed. But on top of it, if you wish, you can always have your own custom status to determine what is the life cycle for a defect in your organization or your project. Further to add, of course, you can include any kind of references which you think could be a good source of information for someone to understand that what was the defect all about. So put together, these are all those common fields what why you must look forward to include when it comes to defect management or writing a defect report, which in turn would help you to understand the defect at any point of time, generate reports, or even spend your time learning lessons from your defects to improve your test process altogether. However, we'll talk about the test process improvements in the next level that is test manager. But at this point, just wanna let you know that defects are very helpful in determining the overall test process improvement as well. Well, that's all from this particular tutorial team. And with that, we also complete the chapter five. We'll look at some sample questions in our next tutorial and get started with chapter six. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. 
I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning. Thank you.